Welcome to part three of the series of three lectures on telomeres and telomerase. This third part is going to be on stress, which I will define, and telomeres and telomerase in humans. In the previous two lectures, you'll remember that we talked about the fact that if you have plenty of telomerase, then homeostasis in the sense of telomere length maintenance can be maintained. There's a balance of lengthening and shortening processes on telomeres so that an average length of telomere is maintained and the cells can keep dividing if there's enough telomerase and other conditions are met essentially indefinitely. So now I want to put this kind of cellular and molecular information that we've been gaining about telomeres and telomerase into perspective with respect to humans and a question that is greatly of interest to many people and that is the question of how do we age? What underlies this familiar kind of progression shown in this series of pictures here? The first thing I'd like to emphasize is that aging is a multifaceted process. Uh, I think there's plenty of reason to think that that's the case and there won't perhaps be a single answer. So I will really focus on one particular aspect of it. And even at the level of whole humans, we can think of multiple facets of the process of aging. And one of them is the observation that there's increased susceptibility to certain kinds of diseases. And we can wonder about this and wonder how much of this is environmental, life factors, stochastic, and how much of this is genetic. And of course, no doubt there will be much interaction between those two. I'm going to talk about some work studying telomere maintenance in humans and show an interesting uh, set of findings that suggest that the environmental and life factors aspects can certainly play a role. And that is not to say genetics is not important and I'll show you a sort of situation where it's clear genetics is important as well. So if we think about this susceptibility to diseases and mortality, um, one can wonder about the genetic and the non-genetic aspects. And I'm going to show you a graph that came from Gavrilova and Gavrilov uh, just to give you an example of the fact that the genetic and the non-genetic components of aging are not just monotonic across the decades of human adulthood. So this was a study of over 5,000 daughters of well-to-do daughters uh, of well-to-do families in Europe and which there was good genealogical information as to the father's lifespan and the mother's lifespan and the daughter's lifespan. And so with this database of over 5,000 daughters with such complete information and all of whom were uh, well-to-do, uh, the question was asked of the daughters who lived to be 30 years and older, how did their lifespan relate to either their father's lifespan, which is shown here, as I'll explain, or the mother's lifespan? And I'll just tell you about that. But it was very similar to what I've shown you here for the paternal lifespan. And the relationship was this. If you looked at daughters um, who lived to be a certain age and asked what their life expectancy was compared with the rest of the daughters who were born in those same years, and compared with how old their fathers grew to be before they died, in other words, what was their father's lifespan. For people who had fathers who lived to be 75 years and older, there was really quite a strong relationship between the greater the father's lifespan was, the greater the chance that the daughter would live longer than expected. And so this function, which is called a residual, basically increases with parental lifespan, at least just for the fathers 75 years and older, uh, whose life expectancy was 75 years and older. Uh, and that was uh, the relationship expected if genetics is an important contributor to the daughter's lifespan. Okay, so if the father lived longer than 75 years, then the daughter's 
lifespan was related to it in a way that said genetics was important. But what about all the fathers who didn't live to be 75, who lived to be uh, less? There, the relationship was very random. So in other words, it made little difference whether your father had a lifespan of 40 or your father had a lifespan of 70 years to what your lifespan, the daughter's lifespan, was. So in other words, mathematically, this function around zero, that's expected if actually inheritance is unimportant. Very similar plot was seen when it was the maternal lifespan instead of the paternal lifespan that was uh, plotted out. So in other words, for this great majority of the daughters, over 70% of the daughters um, fell into this category. In fact, um, things that are not genetic, we could call them environmental, stochastic, life factors, non-genetic factors, were clearly more overwhelming quantitatively. So the genetic component was much more important to fathers with a long lifespan than it was for the fathers who had this wide range of somewhat shorter lifespans. It just says that the relationships can be more complicated. And so many summaries have been put forward for this kind of observation, and I've added in another one, and so that is elderly subjects demonstrating exceptional longevity, for which I've just told you there is certain kinds of genetic information that argues that this is really uh, a genetically based uh, phenomenon, exceptional longevity, such elderly subjects have generally been spared the major age-related diseases such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes and cancer. Now those diseases are responsible for most deaths in the elderly. And those are the ones for which one can find a lot of non-genetic uh, causes as well. So cardiovascular disease, diabetes and cancer responsible for most deaths in the elderly and for which there's a significant non-genetic component. So how can one analyze this further and what's this got to do with telomeres? So that is what I'm going to tell you about now, some relatively recent research which connects these with telomere maintenance now in humans. Okay, so to remind you, if telomeres are replenished by continuous uh, telomerase action, then the cells can keep dividing. And in humans, when one looks at the distribution of telomerase activity in different cell types, one does find telomerase in stem cells and germ cells. These are cells that are expected to be essentially immortal cells. One does find it in human tumors, but I'm not going to talk about that in this part of this lecture series. But one finds telomerase at regulated but real levels in a variety of other normal adult cell types as well. So telomerase in the setting of normal cells is found in stem cells which are necessary for replenishing tissues throughout the lifespan such as immune system stem cells, uh, hair follicle cell stem cells are one class, stem cells in the gut, there are a lot of cells that replenish tissues throughout life and fun finds telomerase in these. But one also does find detectable levels of telomerase in many, many normal adult stem cell, non-stem cells as well. So let's just reiterate the expectations. If you have plenty of telomerase, then homeostasis is going to be balanced, cells will keep dividing. So that would describe the situation for stem cells, for example. Now, if you have just a little bit of telomerase, then what's the situation going to be like in that case? Well, if you had no telomerase at all, we discussed in the first lecture what would happen. There would be progressive shortening of the telomeric DNA. And eventually, when the telomeres became too short, there'd be cellular senescence. And that is indeed observed in some cells that have very, very little telomerase when they grow in culture. But the situation in normal cells in the human body, not cells growing in culture, but the cells 
freshly analyzed from humans, as fresh as you can get the c cells, and you look at them directly, it's a more intermediate situation. So for example, what's the prediction? If you had some telomerase, right, you're going to have the shortening processes going on, but each time the cells are dividing, perhaps there's some telomerase, and so it's trying to keep it up, and, uh, but eventually loses the battle. So if you had some telomerase, the prediction is that since you haven't uh, completely compensated for the shortening processes, while telomerase might be able to keep up, eventually the net shortening will overcome the elongation ability of telomerase and senescence will eventually ensue, you know, later than if you had no telomerase. And if you had some, you know, a little bit less, but still some telomerase, then you'd get there to the point of senescence, but somewhat faster than those cells that had a bit more telomerase. And so it's these situations of this sort of gray zone that seem to be the situation in normal uh, human cells. Now this is important because normal human cells will include certain kinds of stem cells that are required to keep replenishing throughout life and then the proliferating cells that arise from those stem cells that are required to regenerate tissues throughout life such as the immune system. So how do we age? So we've learned a lot as we have studied telomeres and telomerase in the laboratory in model organisms that can now start to feed into this question of in humans and in people susceptible to diseases of aging, how does this happen? How do we age? And the converse can also be true. And let me show you this very striking example. The clinic, the bedside in this uh, little diagram here, the clinic can be very informative as to what might be going on in terms of underlying biology. And such was the case with telomerase. There's a rare inherited condition in humans. It's very rare, but it's now been seen in some dozens of families. You know, we, then we have billions of people on the planet, and even a very rare disease can sporadically show up in amounts that cumulatively add up to dozens of families. This has been seen for a particular disease that happens to have the name Dyskeratosis congenita, which you don't really have to remember because it's not the most clinically relevant aspect that's important here. What's important is that such individuals die from, from progressive bone marrow and they suffer a premature death. They don't make it to old age. And what's the defect? The defect is that a copy of the telomerase RNA gene and the RNA is a single copy gene found and one copy on uh, a particular chromosome. You get one copy of the chromosome from your mother, one from your father, or vice versa. So you normally have two copies of the telomerase RNA gene indicated as this little yellow bar and on these chromosomes. So these are the two chromosomes that have the telomerase RNA gene, one that you got from your mother and one that you got from your father. When one of those copies don't work, then the primary clinical problem is progressive bone marrow failure. This, as I said, causes premature death. Indeed, it can cause it uh, early adulthood, sometimes even childhood, uh, up to middle age. Such individuals have telomeres that are way shorter than the normal range seen in healthy individuals who do not have this inherited condition or in their um, family members who do not inherit this mutation. The characteristic is that the immune system has become exhausted. It looks probably as though stem cells or the cells that arise from stem cells in the immune system just lose the ability to proliferate all the way through a normal life expectancy. As I said, the progressive bone marrow failure, which is the primary cause of much of the death, um, that is the problem and the immune system then cannot keep being replenished which normally happens, of course, from cells in the bone marrow. Interestingly, such individuals are cancer prone. They have very short telomeres. And as I said in the first part of these three lecture series, telomerase can act to protect the ends of chromosomes. And if we have deficient telomerase, then that may be one reason why the chromosome ends are dysfunctional. They're not protected. And 
Secondly, the telomeres are um, simply shorter, so they're also more prone to becoming dysfunctional. So the important result, which was found in 2001 by Valiami et al., was that mutating one or other copy from mother or father, it didn't make a difference who uh, had passed the gene down, but if one of the copies of the telomerase RNA gene was mutated, as is the case in the family members affected by this inherited disease, even though the other gene copy is wild type, these are the ensuing uh, consequences. The important message is that to get through a healthy full human lifespan requires both the telomerase RNA alleles, that means gene copies, to be functional. That means the quantity of the gene product matters. So this is what the rare inherited disease told, that even a 50% gene dosage, one functional gene instead of two functional gene copies, even a 50% gene dosage is a big problem in the long lifespan of humans. Even though one can get often to adulthood, early adulthood, one cannot keep um, going throughout life. And the thing that's going wrong is the ability of systems such as the immune system to keep replenishing itself. So the cell proliferation ability is diminished. Okay, but that's a rare disease. Is this relevant to what happens in the vast majority of humans who do not have this rare disease, informative as it is? But now that gave a strong clue to look. And so what's the situation for humans who are not ostensibly carrying any known genetic disease, what's the effect of common variations in how their telomeres are maintained in humans? Variations caused by, for example, non-genetic differences between individuals. So to put it in perspective, a very interesting observation was made in 2003 by Cawthorn and colleagues, and they reported in a cohort of about 60 unrela uh, sorry, 140 unrelated people aged 60 years and older. When they had shorter telomeres in their white blood cells, which are the cells that are easily analyzed, and a blood sample taken from a healthy individual can be analyzed for its white blood cell telomeres, and the average telomere length in those cells, it was found that such individuals with shorter blood cell telomeres have higher mortality rates than those in the same cohort of people with longer telomeres in those white blood cells. And specifically, the shorter telomeres were associated with a threefold higher mortality rate from heart disease and an eightfold higher mortality rate from infectious diseases. And that's interesting given what I just told you about the fact that a 50% gene dosage compared with the normal 100% gene dosage of telomerase RNA in people with the rare disease, uh, dyskeratosis congenita, that that was enough to make their bone marrow depleted and so they couldn't fight off infections. In fact, they die of infections. So that's a very interesting observation in light of the genetic observations. And indeed, from all causes, of mortality in this elderly cohort of people who were followed for 17 years subsequent to the time that their telomeres were analyzed. Overall, from all causes, the people with the shorter telomeres had higher mortality rates, in other words, poorer survival, compared with those with the longer telomeres. So the telomere length was measured from samples that had been st stored uh, away in the freezer and then 17 years later it was taken out and analyzed and these comparisons were made but it was the subsequent 17 years that were related to whether the telomeres at the beginning of the 17 year period had been shorter or longer. So this was if you will a prospective kind of a study. The shorter telomeres predicted higher mortality rates but what caused what? Okay. Were the telomeres shorter then, because they were already fighting off some of these diseases and perhaps there had been more um, of turning over of cells and telomeres had become shorter already, because people were already prone to these sorts of 
mortality uh, causes, for example? Or was it the other way around? Were the telomeres shorter and did that make the people less able in the subsequent 17 years to avoid mortality from these causes and indeed all causes? These results did not say what came first or what caused what. So now I want to tell you about some more recent experiments which start to give one kind of indication of causality in this otherwise we know quite complex uh, question of what is causing susceptibility to the diseases of aging. And this was a collaboration which involved studying chronic life stress and relating that to cellular aging, which in this case will be related to telomere maintenance and risks of cardiovascular disease. And our group collaborated with the group of Dr. Elisa Eppel at the University of California, San Francisco's psychiatry department and a number of other colleagues uh, who are all listed here. So now I want to tell you about those uh, findings, which are now done with um, human beings in in vivo participants in these clinical studies. Okay, so the study design was to study uh, chronic psychological stress. And so 62 healthy premenopausal women aged 20 to 50 in this group who were the biological mothers of either a healthy child, the control mothers, or a chronically ill child, uh, a group uh, of caregiving mothers, they were studied. Uh, and so first of all, they did a standardized questionnaire which has had a good track record of an as, as being an assessment of perceived stress. And then the other parameter measured uh, that I'll first talk about was the number of years that the caregiving mothers had been caregiving mothers, that was analyzed, and the number of others that I will allude to later. So first of all, the study design was to assess the perceived stress for the whole group, both the control and the caregiving mothers, and then the number of years of the situation of being in this acutely stressful situation, well not acutely stressful, chronically stressful situation, being the caregiver of their child who's chronically ill from a variety of causes. Okay, so uh, three markers of cellular aging were looked at, telomerase activity, telomere length, and also a measure of cellular oxidative stress, which is a ratio of two compounds, F2 isoprostanes and vitamin E, and that was just taken as a, an assessment of the oxidative um, stress situation physiologically in these individuals. We'll focus on telomerase activity and telomere length. So this was the uh, study design as I just went through. And so the questions were, were the level of perceived stress across both groups of mothers and the duration of caregiving in the caregiver group, were those quantifiable parameters related to markers of cell aging? And the three were telomerase activity, telomere length and cellular oxidative stress. Now, just to show you how we measure telomerase activity, what we did was we measured telomerase activity in the white blood cells of these individuals. These are all healthy individuals, but they gave blood samples. One could analyze telomerase activity, and this is the telomerase activity gel. We use three different concentrations, always to make sure that we're in the linear range, comparing it with internal controls of various kinds, and a reference sample, which is shown here. And then we quantified all these bands, made sure we're in the linear range, and related it back to the number of viable cells. So we could simply treat telomerase activity in white blood cells as a quantitative parameter, a continuously varying quantitative parameter. And so across the group you find typically the lowest and the highest, it's about 20-fold difference, and across the group there's a log normal distribution of telomerase activities per cell in the different humans in the studies. And we've looked at that in a number of studies and found the same thing. Okay, just to give you a, a little bit more detail, the oxidative stress assessment came from looking at the ratio of isoprostanes per milligram of creatinine, that's to normalize, uh, over vitamin E, a sort of net oxidative stress assessment, if you will. And this kind of ratio has been used as one kind of marker of oxidative stress and, oxi and antioxidant defenses that are current in that individual.
Okay, so what was interesting was that right away one could see that quantitatively the worse was the perceived stress, the higher the score of perceived stress, that is the worse it was, the lower was the telomerase length, the lower was the telomerase activity by this assay I've told you about, and actually the worse, the higher was the oxidative stress index right across the range, across the entire um, sample that included the control mothers and the caregiving mothers. Very interestingly, the number of years of caregiving, and obviously this was now in the caregiving group, similarly was related in just the same way. So the number of years of caregiving was related directly to how much shorter the telomeres got, how much lower the telomerase was, and how much higher the oxidative stress um, index was. So this, just to show you uh, a couple of samples of data, here's the high stress quartile, and this was corrected uh, very carefully against all sorts of other parameters in this very well controlled group, and these relationships didn't go away. Here, for example, are the data um, compared uh, for the high stress and the low stress quartiles, for example, and you can see here's the average and here's the range for the high stress quartile, and there's less telomerase, about half the amount of telomerase on average, as there is in the low stress quartile. And again, the error bars say that this was quite a significant observation uh, taken together with the number of individuals analyzed. So this was a striking relationship, as was the relationship of telomere length. Now, I'm just going to point to the error bars. They're very small here. This is the high stress, this is the low stress quartile. You can see these are very different. Here we've controlled for age and body mass index, for example, controlling for a lot of other factors. One still cannot make this difference in the high stress versus the low stress go away. So we are left with the conclusion that the strong, uh, vec uh, the strong variable here is the, is the stress level. Here's the oxidative stress now, the high stress quartile, the low stress quartile, again distinct. So stress perception and caregiving duration are linked to cell aging markers as uh, assessed by telomerase, telomere length and oxidative stress. So the idea of cell aging is of course the more the cell has gone through replicative divisions and the more aged it is in the sense of going down towards critically short telomeres, then that would be reflected in lower telomere length and potentially lower telomerase. Oxidative stress is going to assess the damage to the molecules in the cells, another measure of their potential aging. Now what are the causal directions? What are the mechanisms? I'll give you two short kinds of indications. First of all, what about the causal direction? So we're seeing these associations, what caused what? Now the number of years of caregiving was a very important uh, thing to think about. So this was the plot of that. This is the number of um, years of the caregiving situation. And you can see it ranged from actually one year in some of the mothers, some of the mothers had, had four, some six, eight, ten, some had all the way as long as 12. And that was, as you see, quite strikingly related to the shortness of the telomeres. So the ones who had fewer years had longer telomeres on average than the ones who had more years. A similar relationship held for the telomerase activity levels. So this gave us uh, an important kind of indicator that chronic stress is what's wearing down the telomeres. Because of this number of years of caregiving, that objective stress or situation being directly related. So we have one arrowhead in this otherwise, no doubt, very complex set of interactions, and that is chronic stress. This is now years of chronic stress of a particular kind characterized by the difficulties of caregiving uh, in an unpredictable and often uncontrollable situation. Chronic stress is causing lower telomerase and shorter telomeres, and one could predict that the lower telomerase are in fact, is in fact leading to the shorter telomeres. Okay. Now we know from our biological studies that such effects in normal cells will reduce the ability eventually of cells to replenish themselves. So that's an important uh, 
piece of the picture because from many model systems and biological studies of cells that relationship we know is the case. So in whole humans we're finding this arrowhead is uh, in that direction in this particular setting of the chronic caregiving situation. Now what about mechanisms? In such individuals when their stress hormones were measured, so these are stress hormones that are produced uh, in response to the brain dealing with this stress, so the chronic stress situation, cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine levels are higher uh, in highly stressed individuals. They are also higher in the low telomerase half of people than in the high telomerase half of people. In other words, you had worse stress hormones if you had low telomerase than if you had high telomerase. This is not implying causality, but the relationship is there, and so it's going to be very interesting to ask whether these stress hormones indeed cause the lower telomerase that is observed in the white blood cells of these individuals. Okay, so now we have a, a, a new connection here, which we can think of in this way. We think of a signal input, if you will, to the brain. Now that is the chronic stress. Now thereafter, things will get very complex. We'll have all sorts of brain-body interactions. We can think of them as signal integration and processing, but a readout, a very quantitative readout, is telomerase is lower, telomeres are shorter. The question is, does that matter at all? Is there any impact on disease? Fortunately, in this study, uh, a great many other parameters were measured. So let's think about cardiovascular disease. What do we know about that? Well, a great deal is known about the risk factors for cardiovascular disease. For example, in one of the largest epidemiological studies of risk, risk factors that's been undertaken, 29,000 people in 52 different countries in um, five, six different continents, uh, six major prominent factors for cardiovascular disease risk were shown to be this list here in this study published by Yusuf et al. in 2004. And they're all the ones you expect, smoking, poor lipid profile, high blood pressure, diabetes, abdominal obesity, psychological stress. Psychological stress. Ah, now this was the same kind of psychological stress as the kind that had been measured in this study I just told you about the mothers and caregiving mothers. So actually this was the same kind of measure and I just told you that relationship had been uh, found that is lower telomerase activity, higher oxidative index, shorter telomeres had been found associated with the higher levels of psychological stress and the longer the duration of the psychological stress. So we had one, but actually in this very well-designed studies all of these had also been measured and so in fact there were measures for either the risk factor itself or in one case a surrogate for it. One of the risk factors is diabetes. That's a known risk factor for cardiovascular disease. All the individuals in this study I told you about were all healthy, so by definition nobody had diabetes, but in fact fasting insulin and glucose were measured, and those are, if they're high, a risk factor for diabetes. So all of these risk factors, or in this case a surrogate for the risk factor, were all in place in this study. So the question was, well, since these three had been associated with the level of psychological stress and the duration of psychological stress, what about these? Interestingly, it turned out that the one thing that emerged for all of these was in this study which has been published, lower telomerase activity in the white blood cells. So that went with smoking, it went with the bad cholesterol blood lipid profiles, it went with worse uh, cardiovascular activity profiles with higher fasting glucose, higher adiposity, and as we talked about, higher and longer psychological stress. So the one parameter that emerged in this particular study was lower telomerase activity. Now, which as we have talked about is predicted to lead to lower telomere length, but that didn't emerge in this particular study perhaps because the individuals were relatively young. So just to show you for smoking, uh, here is the range of telomerase activity 
per cell in the white blood cells for the non-smokers, you see it follows a broad distribution. In fact, this is a log normal distribution for the whole group. Here are the smokers. Uh, they're all very, very low telomerase. In fact, the p-value, the probability that this would be observed just by chance, is very, very low. So telomerase was very low in the smokers. There is no causality implied here. This is just the association. Here's a very interesting observation for heart function. So one can take all the telomerase activity numbers for the entire group and simply divide them down the middle, it's called a median split, into those who have low telomerase and those who have high telomerase. Now, some laboratory analyses uh, of these individual participants was, were done. People sat for, um, uh, you know, half an hour or longer, and then their resting heart rate was measured. And so here's the value for the high telomerase half, and here's the value for the low telomerase half. You can see right away that the low telomerase half have higher heartbeat rate, just even resting, than the lower telomerase half. The pulse pressure, the blood pressure, is higher for the low telomerase people than the high telomerase people. So in other words, these, the, 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 these are less healthy. There's a parameter called high frequency heart rate variability. Basically the variability is how well the heart is adapting to changing needs. So when it's high, that's good, it's adapting well. So you can see it's higher in the people with high telomerase than it is with the low telomerase group. Everybody's sitting resting. Then, an interesting uh, other thing was done in these individuals. They were asked to undergo a series of laboratory psychological stressors in a very controlled setting. So they are uh, asked to anticipate giving a short videotaped speech, to give the speech, and then to do some very unpleasant mathematics in a highly controlled environment in which individuals who are trained personnel look at them stony-faced. And so that normally elicits a very uncomfortable response. Interestingly, how people responded depended on whether they fell into the high or low telomerase group. So I'll just show you the curves, it's quite striking. So what you expect is, of course, your heart rate will go up uh, as you um, become more nervous and uncomfortable with these um, deliberately uncomfortable, a rather unpleasant task. And you can see that the low telomerase people, their heart rate went way up much more, it was already resting higher, went up much more in response than the high telomerase people. Similarly, their pulse pressure went much higher and then eventually came down somewhat than the high telomerase people. And the heart rate variability showed a nice healthy response in the high telomerase individuals but a much less healthy lack of ability to adapt in the low telomerase people. So simply splitting all of the telomerase activity measurements into just two halves, the high half and the low half, showed very different heart functions. And in all cases, the difference was that the low telomerase group always had the unhealthy response that is predicted to lead to have more of a cardiovascular disease risk. So what we've seen then is that, in summary, the low telomerase alone, even in the absence of obvious telomere shortening, which may well happen later but hasn't happened in this group, is associated with six major risk factors, including chronic psychological stress for cardiovascular disease in people. And so that raises an interesting question of is telomerase status in normal cells uh, if, of people an indicator of their disease risk for, for example, cardiovascular disease. Now indeed, telomere shortening has been seen a lot uh, as something that is being associated with disease risks and indeed disease incident now in more and more cohorts. So just to, up, to um, finish the idea, the idea is if you have lower telomerase, we know that will be one of the things that will help drive telomere length down because telomere length maintenance will be less able to be at the optimum level if telomerase is down. So that, as we know, it reduces the ability of cells to replenish themselves. Now, that... Uh, 
then makes us step back and say, well, what about telomerase and genetic components? I've just talked to you about a clearly non-genetic component, years of stress uh, induced by a chronic caregiving situation. Here, uh, let's consider known genetic defects. Mouse telomerase has been knocked out in model organisms, and I told you about the effects of losing function of half the telomerase gene dosage in humans. Again, telomerase activity goes down and telomere length maintenance is going down. And in this case, it's known, the cause is known to be less telomerase and telomere length does indeed go down. And indeed, one does see reduced ability of cells to replenish themselves in these situations where genetically telomerase has been knocked down. So one knows for sure that that is leading to these effects. Now, what about disease impact? Indeed, the genetic defects do lead to diseases. And in mouse models in which telomerase is knocked out, there is indeed evidence for diseases of the kind that can include propensity to cardiovascular disease. OK, now, what's been seen clinically for many years is chronic stress, which we can think of as that signal input, clearly has disease impact. This has been seen in a great many different studies. Now we've added a new question. Does that occur via lower telomerase? And that is the open question. So as I said, what we know is we have one arrowhead here. We know chronic stress indeed can cause less telomerase and worse telomere maintenance, shorter telomeres, which we know from our biological studies does in fact affect whether cells can replenish themselves. We know from the genetic studies that that can lead to disease impact. But the question is, is this the case in the human studies I've described to you? Is this really what's causing the disease impact via the lower telomerase or is it that the chronic stress actually has its disease impact because of unrelated reasons? Or more likely, is it a combination of the two? So that is where things are standing right now. Finally, just let me show you a lot of data that have been accumulating in the last few years in which low telomere length is being more and more linked to rather common diseases of aging such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, vascular dementia, various degenerative conditions, diabetes, and in fact, risk factors overall for chronic disease. And a great many studies have linked shorter telomeres in white blood cells to these rather common diseases of aging or risk factors for such diseases. So in a great many cohorts, low telomere length is certainly linked to these diseases the causality, of course, is not determined by any of these studies. But we think that we may have a clue from our finding that chronic stress will have effects on lowering telomerase, which is expected to lead to lower telomere length. So back to this general statement about um, genetic and non-genetic aspects of aging in humans and the disease susceptibilities uh, that lead to mortality in humans the general observation is that elderly subjects demonstrating exceptional longevity have generally been spared these major age-related diseases such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes and cancer, which are responsible for most deaths and for which I've just shown you the kind of evidence that is beginning to accumulate, uh, suggesting that there are non-genetic, as well as of course some genetic components for these uh, diseases. And so these non-genetic as well as genetic causes are obviously very interesting since these major diseases are responsible for most of the deaths in the elderly. So how do we age? The question has come from what we've learned in the lab about cells and molecules.
telomerase, telomeres, how their continued maintenance affects abilities of cells to maintain themselves. In animal models, one sees that if it's compromised, can lead to cell death and mortality of the organism. That knowledge has been carried to the understanding of some of the diseases of aging and back. And so this continuous sort of uh, cycle of knowledge and understanding, I think, is going to be an important part of how we address the question of how do we age. So let me summarize with a little metaphorical picture. The summary is that it's emerging that shortening of telomeres in human cells is associated with shortening of life. So if we think of a chromosome and the telomeric uh, structure at its end, I like to think of this structure as being a beautiful elaborate tree. And what we are trying to understand are the sorts of things that lead this beautiful tree to erode down to a stump. Thank you.